Okay, so we saw how um, Gray made a comparison between um, the lives of the rich people and the poor and he said that they had led a very peaceful life, they had no complaints. And then he goes on in the next stanza to say, yet even these bones from insult to protect, some frail memorial still erected nigh, with uncouth rhymes and shapeless sculpture decked, implores the passing tribute of a sigh. So he says that it is true that these people did not have huge tombs and vaults erected, but attempts were made to protect these bones from insult. Insult in the sense that uh, it is uh, highly, it is supposed to be a mark of disrespect for, to leave a, a dead body uh, out in the open or to have animals dig them up, you know, that cannot be permitted. And so to protect these bones and save them from insult, even in a village graveyard, you can find some kind of frail memorial may not be elaborate tombstones or graves but then some frail memorial and you would also find some rhymes just like you have an epitaph uh, an epitaph is something you know that is written on the graves epitaph e-p-i-t-a-p-h so um, even in these village churchyards you would find some attempt at uh, marking the grave of a person there would be some rhymes written some shapeless sculpture sculpture it would be decorated with some shapeless uh, statue or a sculpture uh, not like the grand ones that you would find in a city uh, or in in uh, over the grave of a rich man which implores a passing tribute of a sigh so when you see these graves you remember these people and you heave a sigh. So the purpose of these uh, graves is to remind you that people are lying here dead. Their name, their year, spelt by the unlettered muse, the place of fame and elegy supply. So instead of um, famous uh, tombs and monuments, you have you you would call them mausoleums you know a mausoleum is a huge kind of a structure constructed in memory of a dead person so they don't have such mausoleums or places of fame or uh, nobody writes elegies to commemorate these ordinary people but even then they have their own unlettered muse an unlettered muse is a local poet somebody who writes a few words uh, for these people so their names and the year, the year, the how old they a person was when he died, when did he, when was he born, when did he die, all these things that you usually find on a uh, gravestone would be found here also. Mm -hmm. And many a holy text around cheese truths uh, that teach the rustic moralist to die. And also uh, there would be a smattering of uh, lines from the Bible because usually on the grave you would find words taken from the Bible written. So then. Uh, some unlettered muse uh, would uh, they would be in every village there would be somebody who does all this and so um, here too you would have a grave and you would have a kind of a very humble uh, gravestone and then he asks again a very pertinent question for who to dumb forgetfulness a prey this pleasing anxious being ever resigned left the warm precincts of the cheerful day now cast one longing lingering look behind so he says, who likes to succumb to forgetfulness? Is there any person who would die very happily and willingly? Every human being would like to look back when he knows that death is nearing. He would hope that he would, he would long for at least one more day. He would, when death takes him along, he would go looking he would be turning back each and every time because he knows that he will not be coming back so he says whether a person is rich or poor whether you are powerful or whether you are um, uh, powerless whether you are a city dweller or a villager whoever you are a human being generally doesn't like to die and you don't like to be forgotten even if you know that death is inevitable you like somebody to remember you you like somebody to shed a tear for you so that's why he asked the question who likes to be forgotten 
who likes to leave the warm precincts of the cheerful day and go back into the eternal darkness of the day nobody does on some fond breast the parting soul relies some pious drops so here um, when a person dies when we die we like uh, to be remembered by somebody not maybe not everybody but at least we want uh, your dearest one your your husband or your wife or your uh, parents or your children your friends you want them to remember you so on some fond breast fond here means loving breast the parting soul relies some pious drops the closing i requires pious drops here means um, tears when a person is closing his eyes forever he likes to see tears in the eyes of others because that makes him feel that he is important that he was loved that people want him to be with them be with them even from the tomb the voice of nature cries even in our ashes live the wonted fires so even after a person dies uh, you can hear the cries it means uh, even long after a person is dead you uh, i mean why do we have all these uh, uh, in in uh, according to the hindu uh, um, way of life why do we conduct uh, rites for people who are dead it is because we believe that their souls um, expect us to do such things and you say that the soul would not go away in peace if their desires are left unfulfilled so it is very difficult for a person to cut away his ties sever his ties from this world and move off into the other and we often hear stories whether it's true or not about uh, the souls or the ghosts you call them of dead people coming back if something is left unfulfilled so um, that is why he says here that nobody likes to die and even when a person dies he likes to see he likes to be assured of being remembered by his close ones and um there is always a longing to come back for thee who unma- who mindful of the honored unhonored dead dust in these lines their artless tale relate if chance by lonely contemplation led some kindred spirit shall inquire thy fate so after this uh, that's a or just a very general statement he made about all human beings now he comes back to himself or to uh, the speaker and then he says for thee these uh, he says that uh, the person sometimes later uh, for thee who un- mindful of the unhonored dead who is mindful of the unhonored dead this man who spend his time to think about these unknown people and to write about them he is the man who is mindful of the unhonored dead and so he ha- uh, had related or narrated their tale in these artless in a very artless manner because he doesn't consider himself as a great poet he says that i have uh, narrated their stories to you in a very artless manner and if chance by lonely contemplation led some kindred spirit so some day he wishes he hopes that somebody like him a kindred spirit somebody like him who is uh, who cares for ordinary people so at a later date somebody might come and ask what happened to this man you know there was a man uh, who wrote this poem about these ordinary people what happened to him so some kindred spirit shall inquire thy fate and happily some uh, hoary headed swain might say hoary headed swain uh, is refers to a villager a peasant hoary headed white head okay somebody an old man whose hair has uh, gone gray happily or uh, he, he means here then if this question is asked if an enquiry is made about me then some hoary headed swain some villager who had seen me now many years later that man would be old he might say oft we have seen him at the peep of dawn brushing with hasty steps the dews away to meet the sun upon the upland dawn so if somebody enquires you to yes yes i remember having seen this man he uh, we could we would often see him in the early morning and he would be walking hastily away brushing with hasty step the dews away to meet the sun upon the upland lawn so he would uh, we have often or i have often seen him walking upland as if he is rushing to meet the rising sun 
there at the foot of yonder nodding beech that wreathes its old fantastic roots so high his listless length at noontide would he stretch and pour upon the brook that babbles by sometimes he says sometimes we used to see him early in the morning sometimes we would see him in the afternoon where would we see him under the nodding beech tree nodding tree in the sense a tree which is moving swaying to the wind mm. so uh, we would see him lying there among the roots of uh, this uh, tree mm. and listless he's a, he's a tall man maybe and uh, kind of very languid lazy he just stretches himself there in the afternoon mm. and there is a brook that is running by that babbles by you know that brooks or little streams can be very noisy so in the afternoons we would often see this man lying there under the tree the beech tree and looking into the babbling stream pouring upon to pour upon is to look carefully uh, you usually pour over papers or pour over books means you concentrate and read so here uh, he was often seen lying there under a tree uh looking into this babbling stream hard by yon wood now smiling as in scorn muttering his wayward fancies he would rove now drooping woeful van like one forlorn or crazed with care or crossed in hopeless love so this man could be seen at various times of the day in various moods sometimes he would be smiling to himself as if he is conning somebody sometimes he would be muttering that is talking to himself like a madman he would just roam around talking to himself sometimes he would uh, appear to be a very forlorn man dejected woeful wan tired woeful means upset gloomy so sometimes you would see him in that mood drooping sometimes he would look look as if he is crazed with care or crossed in hopeless love like a lover who has been rejected by his lady love he or some uh, like a man who is kind of weighed down by his worries that is why crazed with care so at various times this man can be seen wandering around in various moods sometimes smiling sometimes uh, talking to himself sometimes kind of as though he is going to cry or burst out into tears sometimes upset so anyway one way or the other we would see him i used to see him for a long time and then one and then one morning what happened was uh, i started missing him means i couldn't see him anymore one morn i missed him on the customed hill along the heath and near his favorite tree another came nor yet beside the rill nor up the lawn nor at the wood was he so then after a few days or maybe after a few years this man noticed that this young man was not to be seen anymore uh, the customed hill here means accustomed the place where was he was usually found there he was not there you uh, look for him in the heath he was not there looked for him in the uh, under his favorite tree he was not to be found now yet beside the rill rill was that uh, babbling uh, brook you remember he was not to be found there he could not be seen in the lawn he could not be seen in the woods so where was he the next with dirges due in sad array slow through the churchway path we saw him born approach and read for thou canst read the lay graved on the stone beneath yon aged thorn so he says the next time i saw him he was dead and people were carrying him along people were carrying his corpse his dead body along with the dirges dirges are mournful songs sung when a person dies so there was a procession a sad array a, a slow procession of people taking him carrying him that's why born along in the, with the accompaniment of these funeral songs he was taken and to the church for his last rites and this man tells the man who inquires see there you can find his grave go on because you look like a man who can read you look like an educated person so go on you can read the lay lay is a song or a poem you can see there is something written on his grave go on and read it graved on the stone here means engraved so there is something written on the gravestone so on the stone beneath yon aged thorn so there there is a thorny plant growing there uh, and you can see a grave near that that is this man's grave go there and read it because you are a man who can read 
so the 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 speaker is telling us that one fine day he too will die and somebody if somebody inquires about him this is what the villagers would say about him and they would ask um, the person who inquired to go on and read the epitaph and now the last three stanzas we have the epitaph of um, um, epitaph written on the grave of this poet so gray has kind of already written an epitaph for himself and this is what uh, the epitaph reads like here rests his head upon the lap of earth a youth to fortune and to fame unknown fair science frowned not on his humble birth and melancholy marked him for her own large was his bounty and his soul sincere heaven did a recompense as largely send he gave to misery all he had a tear he gained from heaven it was all he wished a friend no father seek his merits to disclose or draw his frailties from their dread abode there they alike in trembling hope repose the bosom of his father and his god so he says that um this is what the epitaph would read like here lies a young man who was unknown to fortune and fame because uh, thomas gray always had this uh, feeling that he was not recognized i told you that he published only 13 poems because some of his poems were severely criticized by uh, the critics of those days and he kind of lost his confidence and he was very self critical and he did not consider himself to be a very good poet on the whole maybe uh, on that front he must have been dissatisfied that is why he says here lies a young man who was unknown to both fortune and fame he was neither famous nor was he rich fair signs but frown not on his humble birth though he came from a humble family signs did not frown on him in the sense here signs can mean knowledge he got himself an education he became a scholar and later he became a professor so knowledge or signs did not um, show any discrimination uh, towards him because he was a humble birth uh, signs or knowledge did not discriminate um uh, uh, towards him on the basis of his humble birth but she amply blessed him with all she could and melancholy marked him for her own because he was a very quiet person a very gloomy kind of a person so he says that melancholy claimed this young man to be hers and he was always a very quiet and gloomy man large was his bounty means he had a very uh, bountiful soul he was very generous he loved everybody his soul was very sincere and um, that was a, a compensation that the heaven uh, gave him that is he had a very uh, bountiful heart um, and a very broad minded um, um, attitude and he had a sincere soul so though god did not bless him with fortune and fame he blessed him he compensated it by giving him bounty and sincerity and this man gave to misery all he had because misery was something that he always had with him and so he gave all he had a tear and instead he gained a great blessing from heaven and what was that a friend i guess he is uh, referring here to richard west who was a great friend of his there is i remember reading that somewhere in between he fell out of his friendship with richard west but once again they came back together so all he wished was to have a good friend and heaven rewarded him with a wonderful friend and it was that friend who died and it is that death that prom uh, that uh, prompted him to write this poem it is believed no father seek his merits to disclose so he says let him be don't try to uh, find out what his merits were don't try to drop his frailties from their dread about dread about his death don't try to assess uh, or make a judgment of him i don't want my um, merits to be disclosed or i don't want you to discuss my frailties let them be they are alike in trembling hope repose they alike means both his frailties and his merits they are in trembling hope repose or they in trembling hope repose the bosom of his father and his god that is the dead soul 
awaits um, arrival at uh, the bosom of his father and his god so a dead man hopes to finally reach the uh, bosom or the heart of his father and his god with all his frailties with all his merits he would finally be taken into the abode of god and he is waiting the dead man the dead soul is waiting to be absorbed into uh, the abode of god so he doesn't want to be discussed he doesn't want to be to be judged by uh, the others who he has left behind so he requests that he be left alone in his grave so that is how the poem ends it ends with this epitaph and uh, the theme of this poem mainly is death and how death is a leveler and how all the uh, fortunes that we amass during our life it fails to keep death away that all men are equal whether you're rich or poor whether you're a king or a slave death does not discriminate between such uh, you know divisions to death all human beings are alike so the message that he gives us is that we should always learn to live with equanimity we should not allow our power or our wealth or our pride to get the better of us so that we forget the ultimate truth of life let us always uh, remain level headed and understand that death ultimately is something that will come to us your power or your wealth cannot save you from death so let us not be arrogant let us be good to others let us be considerate towards people who are less fortune let us share our wealth and our happiness and our privileges with the less privileged so uh, thomas gray i think from his experience is trying to tell us that what matters in life is not the glories that you amass but ultimately what matters is the contentment with which you live your life so that is why he admires these poor people in the villages they did not have glories they did not have great strives but they led a very happy life so that is what he seems to advocate that is what he seems to uh, you know um, tell us to mm, that let's keep our lives hassle free simple and make the best of what we have so that is all that i have to say about this wonderful poem elegy written in a country churchyard